Here we go. This is our conversation. This is your conversation. I'm so excited to be here with you today. My name is Ami Lee. If I have not already met you, I'm really happy to meet you here now. I am the Director of Public Health at SE International. Some of you are very familiar with SE International. And one thing we are learning in this public health series is that many people come who don't know what SE or SE International is. So you'll learn a little bit more about our organization as we go. But really the goal and purpose of these conversations is absolutely just the pure gift of this content. We're not here to tell you about our programs or anything at all, just to share with you the resources that are robust within the people who make up our community. Today, especially, like my heart is exploding about this particular conversation. I think we all know at this moment in history, we are standing in an immensely complex and challenging set of inquiries that are rising about what it even means to be human and community in this kind of post pandemic world. There's like a thaw in the world. And I, you know, it's optimistic to say post pandemic. I know my heart goes out to people. I know many are still wrestling, but as we're sort of past that massive lethality hump, now all of the inquiries and the conversations that started to wiggle up in that time are really coming to light with a call for clarity and commitment. Um, so that said, in the last few years, we know there was much voice, particularly in the U US, given to social justice concerns following the loss of George Floyd's life. But not entirely unlike the Rodney King incident many years ago, his murder could be perceived as just a flashpoint in history like it's one moment and then the conversation starts to quiet down. And I think the people who are directly impacted and personally impacted by it, notice this, notice that it's been preceded and followed by many more incidents like it. So our hopes is that perhaps in light of how the pandemic is, has stirred a lot of things, that maybe this is really the time that all peoples will begin to take a deeper, deeper look. And, and we know the depth is endless, but a, a deeper look at our own contribution to systemic racism and or the impact on it in ourselves, um, what it might take to heal or recognize our contribution. So hopefully this conversational tide might be turning at this unique time. There's much to be done and discovered. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that only 100 years ago, we're just now discovering that there were massacre of so many indigenous children in boarding schools in this country. There's so much repair and healing to be done and a conversation is one way to begin to move it forward. So today's conversation, like our others, is a public health offering. Yes, this conversation needs to be on the map about multi-ethnic, multi-racial identities and the experience of systemic racism, but it's also undeniably a sacred and very personal conversation. We honor and just with immense gratitude, honor and hold space for the guests today who in their bravery and courage and commitment and boldness of what's emerging in their own relationships with each other have chosen to spend this time with us and share their experience. So with no further ado, thank you for letting me share all that with you all. I know we cannot wait to get this conversation started. So if I could ask the guests, Shireen, Kristen, Inga, please go ahead and turn on your cameras, come off mute, and let's just speak. Hi. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. <laughs> Woo, hello. I wish we Hi. all waved. That was a song. He's a lyric. I wish we all waved. <laughs> oh, my first somatic gesture. Okay, here we go. So ladies, as we do these programs, our... Thank you so much for being here. Our structure has always been, let's let our participants get kind of a feel and a sense of who you are. Rather than me doing some bio that no one wants to hear me say it, let's get to just know you personally right away, but let's know you through a question. If it's okay, is that okay? Okay, cool. All right, here's the question. I heard a lot about how you all met as we started to gather and prepare this. And I would love to, to have the world get to know you by knowing 
why were you seeking one another when you found each other? And how have your relationships as evolved as you've been finding more shared experiences? So why were you seeking each other? Have your relationships evolved with shared experiences? With that, I'm gonna go off screen and just let y'all have some amazing time together. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Almi. Yeah, I mean, I think I can start that given how this all happened. Um, it was actually, me doing uh, assisting through somatic experiencing, I recognized there was a call for people to support Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And I hesitated to like volunteer because I'm white presenting, white bodied. And I was like, that's not appropriate. I don't have the experience of racism that these people have. But then I also felt this part of myself not being recognized. So I ended up um, volunteering as a demo person um, through somatic experiencing, there was a presentation and I forgot to write down the name of it, but I think it was um, incorporating social justice and racism and how to do that with somatic experiencing work. Um, so I volunteered for the demo and um, yeah, so that went out to, I don't know how many people were watching that either, but I, that's how I met Inge. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I was at that uh, presentation or training, I don't know what you would call it, it was an experience. And as uh, Mashid Hager, uh, faculty member, was working with Kristen, I started to viscerally shake. I thought I would not be able to come back for the rest of the day. I was so moved, literally, viscerally, energetically moved. Um, for uh, about my own experience. And then when I found out that Kristen lived just down the mountain from me, I decided to reach out to her and say, we need to talk, let's get together and speak. And, um, and let's, uh, from that we expanded and invited a bunch of people and two people responded positively. And we've been meeting for over a year and almost two. And that was uh, Shireen and Anna Margaret, who's not here with us, but I invite her presence. Anna Margaret is uh, in Miami, but unable to be here to, with us today. And so Shireen, um, you wanna say what led you to accept? Yeah, yeah. So I had met Inge through finishing up my, like what my somatic experiencing consultation hours with you and, I think one of our last consultations um, or case consultations, we had talked about um, just that, like one of my passions is holding space for people who are multicultural, multi-heritage, multi-racial. Um, and even like the complexities within that and being in Minneapolis in the epicenter of where George Floyd was murdered and the uprising that followed. Um, and, it was just really lovely space to have held. And when you had reached out to me to see if this is a space that I'd want to joy and or join, I noticed just even in my body, this like sense of like a little bit of fear, but also like, oh, wow, this is a place that maybe I can belong. Like I can share my experience and know that our experiences aren't the same, but very similar, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and also an, an ancestor acknowledgement. And so for the participants, we invite you to participate in this as well as to remember the ancestors of the land where you are sitting. I am sitting right now in uh, Cold Creek Canyon, Colorado, which is the ancestral lands of the youth people. And um, I also, uh, I was born in Nicaragua, lived there for my formative years. And we never spoke very much about the ancestors of that land. So I want to name at least a couple of the peoples from where I was born, the Chorotegas and the Nahuas or Nicaraos, which is where the name of the country Nicaragua comes from. Uh, and I've been reconnecting with those ancestors on my maternal line as well. 
Um, so most people, so there were two things that really brought me to want to form this group, which was, A, I realized in recognizing that I needed to do some anti-racism work, I recognized, and this, this line from 2020 really hit me in my gut, which is silence is violence. And I, and I started to question all the ways in which I had cr contributed to, you know, unwittingly contributed to white supremacy and all of the ways in which uh, my heritage, which was bicultural from the beginning, I was born to a German father and a Nicaraguan mother in Nicaragua. And so already this was this um, uh, heritage, questioning and confusion around, well, what was I? Um, and yet, even then, the messages of European supremacy were very present, unspoken, but very present. And even then, I remember questioning, well, what is this? Why don't we hang out or socialize more with my mother's family? You know, there were just strange ways in which this implicit white supremacy, European supremacy had embedded itself in my mother and in myself. And so I, I recognized that I wanted to do anti-racism work with people that shared my experience because I didn't feel like I could be in a white group or a um, just a BIPOC group because, you know, let's face it, I have a European name and white skin and most people didn't know until I started naming my ancestry what, who I was, what my identity was. And I'm fluent in Spanish, by the way. So anyways, um, that was, uh, those were the drivers for me. Thanks for letting us start to get to know y'all. Um, I am going to pitch to you a question, if you're up for it, that came in from someone anonymous it's it's a little it's very long to read the whole thing so anonymous I mean no offense I think we can get to the the heart of your question and if if you want to correct how I how I say it since it's, it's about language guys it's a question about language around this um I bet you have a world of things you could say about language um and the person posted anonymously so the assumption is they don't want to come on screen they they said reading the description of the webinar it struck me how it is like reading a different language. That's what they said. I don't know if they realized the description of the webinar was written, written by the three of you. And a lot went into how you put your words together on that. And I think it was important. We've never actually done that with any SC community conversations. Been like, hey, you guys, it put in your own words, you know, but we wanted it in your own words. So they said reading it, it felt like reading a different language. They said they weren't clear on what was being actually articulated. Um, and that there's questions about this kind of language has, you know, is for people who have privilege to engage with it. Um, there's a quote, um, an article that critiques sort of wokeness in universities and institutions and, and is speaking to the language issues around it. I'm um, talking about the credentialed elite. And it seems like the gist of it is that um, it's kind of camouflaging so the word is actually in there, it's rhetorical camouflage. It's camouflaging the real concerns by putting in, inside a certain kind of language. Um, so the person's question at the end is, is there a problem with this kind of language that can be unintelligible to the most disadvantaged people in our communities? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, again, anonymous attendee, please don't let me make any false assumptions. That's not just really want to support your inquiry because they say in our communities, I'm assuming this is someone to whom multi, multi-ethnic, multiracial is personal. And they want to know, is the language of how we talk about this unintelligible to the more disadvantaged people in our community? If you just speak to some language, that would be probably helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I get at least part of that question and maybe not totally, I'm not sure what the camouflaging is, but, um, I think that's when, just like Inge said, said that that's why it's important for us to have a conversation. I can use words, but what do I actually mean by that? You know, I, th I think I would have to break it down and communicate, converse with the person, um, to know 
what about whatever words I used was um, confusing or not clear? How was I not being clear? That's just what came up for me. Oh, well, if Shireen, uh, I don't know if you want to say something, but I, I, I will start by saying this is not a webinar. Um, let's begin there. It's a conversation. And um, Ami made it clear this was not a webinar. And uh, we're not here to teach. We're here to learn. So it's, it's important language. Can't, you know, the Tower of Babel, right? We know that's when confusion began and we began to misunderstand each other. Which is why I think, you know, an understanding of somatics of our nervous system can be helpful because um, I know that when I sit with someone and I really see their humanity and I can listen, uh, sometimes communication can happen without words. And, uh, you know, we are very clear that the conversations that we have been having as a group are messy conversations. It's a curious exploration of topics. And yes, maybe uh, words that have come to encode certain meaning um, that maybe is not accessible and maybe, you know, direct language is more real than encoded language. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try not to use words that are confusing, but just saying that we don't have a roadmap, that we don't really have a vocabulary. We're just learning to explore what it means to us to be in this experience of bridging multiple worlds. I don't know if Shireen, you want to say something about that? I agree with both of what Inge, you said, and you as well, Kristen. Um, I can also in a way, if I understood the, comp the um, what you might call it, the question correctly, um, I can relate to that. There are some times where words are used where for me, I, I do have to ask those follow-up questions of like, what what is being implied? What is being said? Um, and part of that, right, is because my primary caregiver, English was his second language. Um, and so even just the way I communicate with people, um, sometimes English is my first language, but I miss things um, or I will have to ask. And so, um, yeah, that's, yeah. So I guess part of the conversation is how do we begin to understand each other? And um, maybe this is a good opportunity to do a little experiential exercise because I know for me, when I start to feel the energy and pressure rising in me because things are difficult and complex and not simple and linear, um, I start to constrict, which limits my ability to socially engage and see people accurately and um, so I had a little exercise in mind that I know it will help me feel a little better. Is that okay, Ami? This is the fun and games of this conversation. If you'd like to bring other people on screen, would you like, would you like some company doing this exercise, Inga, or would you like to lead us on your own? Sure. No, that's, that'd be great. Let's have a few more people on the screen. Oh, cool. Would any of y'all be willing to do Inga's exercise with if you didn't track all three of these humans, all right, we've got Kirtan. We'll start to port you over to this side. Um, and that will be very exciting. There's a few people joining us. Um, and then be sure you guys, as you're starting to hear this and your own questions are stirring, your nervous system may be stirring and your own inquiries might be stirring. Please be putting some questions in that chat, which will really help Inga, Shireen, and Kristen even know yeah. where to guide their conversation. Hi, Nika. We're bringing a few more. Hi, Nika. A few more on screen. Yeah. yeah, and I just, I notice each yeah. time in my own nervous system, how excited I get each time you guys talk about your group. And I love imagining groups of humans working things out together, finding their own messy way through it. I keep wanting to hear more on that, just how you all are doing that. Okay, here they come. Go ahead and lead us, Inga. All right. 
So one of the things that, that can happen, and maybe you can track your own experience, is pressure can be, begin to build inside of us. And for me, I tend to constrict and tense in and up, and my vision gets very narrow, and I might start to perceive unfriendliness where there's just maybe, you know, apathy or disinterest or, you know. And so one of the ways to come back into connection and re-engagement is to mobilize uh, our neural structures uh, without getting too neurosciency here, our neuro, uh, neuro, neural structures of social engagement, which are in our head, our face, our eyes, our, our neck, our throat. So um, why don't you just take a moment to maybe even just move your shoulder side to side. And then move your head in whatever direction you want, just making sure you gently move in the opposite direction and try to slow down your movements a little bit so you really feel the connection. And then let's make faces. This is the fun part. Make faces. Move your jaw, your cheeks. And just feel the stretching in your face. You're muted, so if you want to make a sound, mobilize the, the vocal cords a little bit. Uh, uh, notice if maybe a breath. I see somebody tapping their face. Yes, this is my face. Waking up those muscles and nerves that have gotten really rigid. Okay. We become rigid in our perceptions of one another sometimes. And then just maybe recall some friendly people in your life, people you know who are friends you can trust. And I'm actually going to look at you all on the screen. I know there are people in the audience that I know that are my friends. And I also, there are a lot of people that I don't know, but I want to see your face and know that we can be friends if we try to understand each other, really see each other's humanity fully. And then notice if anything shifts in your awareness, in your sensations. I know I started to take some deeper breaths. My heart started to slow down and I feel a little more expanded, a little less rigid. Yeah, so I'm curious how that was for you. if you feel more connected to the outside and maybe safer in connection to others. I see some heads nodding. Well, thank you for playing. <laughs> I noticed Inga that you said when we are feeling something like some kind of fear or tightening inside, it changes how we see others. And I yes. just, it, from a different lens than what you're describing today. So just naming that with honor and respect to y'all. I just noticed sometimes hosting these, I'll have the, there'll be a moment, just a natural constriction of like, oh gosh, who's here? Everyone's hate me. And I start looking at faces on the screens and I'm like, oh, everyone's mad at me. <laughs> you know, and, and there's just this, and it's ridiculous. And I can, it's, it's totally no evidence, you know, but my nervous system is convicted based on whatever past fears I have of taking a step out there. That's how I identified with this and working with the face, the way you just had it, I felt that shift. Like I could see how silly. Thank you, Nika, for your giggle. Yeah. And, and that's an example of how when, uh, when we are in a threat physiology, it's really difficult to perceive others as safe. And we begin to other one another and create enmities where they're, maybe don't need to be en enmities 
And, uh, and literally our, our vision becomes narrow, which is threat uh, vision. Whereas after we open things up, we might have more peripheral vision and see more of the world and maybe see our resources, you know? And I think, you know, we talk a lot about ancestral trauma, but we also need to talk about ancestral resources. And um, that's been part of our conversation, how re-engaging with our disowned ancestries, um, I personally have felt that I become more whole, more integrated, and, uh, and more, um, I, I have greater capacity to challenge, right, through education and through accountability and correction, some, some of my old ideas that are not helping uh, bring more harmony to the planet. Beautiful, Inga. I love that you just led us through bringing more harmony to the planet, just through our face and playing with <laughs> So thank you everyone for participating. We're going to send you back over to the uh, attendee side. Yes, thanks for the kisses, Kirtan. <laughs> um, really lovely to be with you, Amy. Your comments there in the chat, um, in the Q&A are really, yeah, the sacredness of this conversation. So please, if any of y'all are starting to have any questions coming up or you'd like us to speak to anything directly, please go ahead and put it in. And um kind of in the absence of questions popping up, but just being with you all a little bit. Um, wondering if you might speak a little bit more just to kind of the very beginning of your group engaging, because I imagine you've come a long way together. How long have you guys been meeting? Almost two years, at least a year and a half. Wow. Wow. Very cool. So probably where you find yourself now is different than then. And I, I got some of that tenuousness that you all had at the moment of meeting and starting the group. And I imagine other people coming to this conversation newly may be in a space like that. So I wonder if you may have some words to share with others who are at that beginning spot and how you even identified, like you guys are going to speak like therapists because you're therapists, <laughs> you know, like that's part of your identities too, right? But I was someone might speak with people within their peer set to get resourced the way you all have. Well, Shireen, you had an interesting way of doing that, that maybe this is the time to talk about, right? Yeah. Um, well, I was, yeah, I was just thinking about how when we first started gathering with one another, we were talking about a lot of like the different pieces of our identity, right? And we all have a common denominator, um, or at least the three of us, right? Where like we are half European, right? Half from like, or like white European descent. Um, and how even within that, right? Like having sometimes, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like having the other part of us kind of pushed away a little bit and not centered. And I loved how at the beginning, we really did talk about these different parts of our identity that maybe we don't talk much about, um, and like our different cultures and the way that being mixed heritage, mixed race, myth, mixed um, ethnicities, um, like how the, all those things can create just who we are holistically as a person. And even like within those conversations and as people have these conversations within their communities, within their families even, too, because identity is complex within families, I really, one thing that anchors me into my body and into my own self when I start to become maybe overwhelmed with like, oh my gosh, who am I? Do I identify with this culture or this? Or how do I choose is to really sit with one absolute truth that I know about myself and, and my identity. And so for me, um, one, one of, one thing that I like to say, or that I like to sit with when I do start to become overwhelmed or lost or have some of this self doubt, um, thoughts come up is, you know, that I, I am deeply embedded in my Persian culture and, really sitting with that and even as I now sit with that fact of my my identity that is part of my truth is that 
I notice my body drops down. I notice my hips more and I notice this expansion in my chest and this overall calming, um, calming piece of myself. That's really nice. And even as I sit with it, I can kind of tease out and bring forward some of the questions or some of the doubts that come up for me. And so I invite people to do that too, right? Mm -hmm. So as we continue on in this conversation, you know, and if you notice yourself becoming overwhelmed, right? What's one absolute truth you know about your identity, your cultural identity um, that really sits with, with that truth? And what do you notice in your body mm -hmm. when you sit with that truth as well? Thank you, Shireen. Yeah, I can feel like a drop off through my center down to my stomach as I think about one truth about me. Mm -hmm. Settling. Yes, I definitely feel that settling and also realized as Shireen, as you said, I know one thing to be true. I know I am Persian and I'm, I forget the exact word you use, but uh, I realize that through the evolution of being together with the two of you, and I get tearful thinking about it, and with Anna Margaret as well, is that I've started to uncover the cultural and ancestral pieces that were not in my consciousness. Again, because they had been erased, you know, in, in my country, we, we didn't even learn in school very much about the uh, original inhabitants of the land. And we also, it, within my family, it, it was also kind of erased, like I said, in favor of uh, the European family. And so I'm only now discovering and what happens is there's this richness and I've had to do some digging to even get some basic history because again, it was not even in the history books. You know, there's the history of the conquistadores and the history of the colonial uh, people, but not so much of the indigenous people. Although I think that there is more evolving. And so that truth for me is beginning to bring more aliveness to me connecting with the, those pieces of the truth that were uh, it, just simply disappeared. And the connection to the Nahua language, uh, because the Nahua language is an Aztec language and it's part of this uto aztecan language family that includes the Ute people of Colorado, which I find an interesting connection. So I'm seeing more connections and um, yeah. Yeah, it's making me think if I, I, I was born and raised in the US um, in the Appalachian region, but if I think about it, I don't know if the Philippines, cause I'm half Filipino, I don't know if that was ever mentioned in our history books. If there was maybe a paragraph, I don't even know, but um, all of our discussion has more prompted me to lean in on oral history and just asking questions from my mom, like hearing about her parents, um, what she knows of the area that we come from. Um, and I can ask probably other family members as well, which I think is important to recognize is very valid, you know, and yeah. recognizing this part of my identity. Yeah, and wanting for it to be seen, right? I think that's been part of our conversation as well is how we how we make the the implicit right the unconscious conscious and explicit so I you know saying more to people like yes I I'm half Filipino or I'm was born and raised in Nicaragua I'm, I'm Latina I speak Spanish don't let my name confuse you <laughs> you know um, I don't speak German <laughs> right. um, and. Um, you know, this brings me to this term that I want to introduce that we've been talking about too in the last few weeks, which come from, comes from the Nahua language. And it's 
Nepantla, Nepantla, and we are Nepantleras, Nepantleras. We straddle. This is this is a Nahuatl word that really means the the in between. We are in between, right? Cultures, and um, you know this this was a word that was uh, popularized by. Uh, Gloria Anzaldúa, she's a Chicana uh, uh, woman who was a scholar and uh, anthropologist and wrote a book called uh, Borderlands, she wrote several books, but talking about the mestizo experience, you know, and, and how, and, and we can expand it, of course, to all the regions of the world, you know, there's multiculturalism is everywhere and it, it's not always white centered. It's not always white and, um, but when you straddle multiple words, and this is, I think the exciting part where I see the resources that are available to us is that we become, at least I feel for me that uh, not only have I felt like I can be, a citizen of the world. It does, I don't have to have a nationalistic identity. I can adapt. Adaptation is one of the gifts of multiculturalism, but we can bridge the worlds. And, and that's my hope that I can learn how to bridge to go back to the question about language and divisive language versus inclusive language. And how can we begin to bridge the gaps so that we can connect and communicate as opposed to uh, just fragment, fragment from ourselves, fragment from one another, fragment our society, you know, and I, I, I think that's one of the gifts that we can uh, try to cultivate, right? Yeah, because we've had to, we've had to build that bridge within ourselves, you know, as, as you've always mentioned, the oppressor and the oppressed in the same body. Mm -hmm. Like, we have to connect that. And if I connect that with a knee, then I can connect with you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. any other resources or gifts that you feel are available as we bridge those uh, cultural gaps? And I think for me, one thing that comes up is like the the difference in like perspective, right? Of like being able to, and maybe this is. This is also like that bridging, like empathetic aspect of things where I am so, like I come from one culture, right? That views things so differently than the other culture that I come from. And so being able to see like the nuance that exists in like different worlds or the overlapping, even like the overlapping messages um, and, um, just even like theologies that come from different cultures and being able to hold two truths to be true, right? So being able to hold dichotomy, um, I think is something that I've really taken away from being multi-heritage and multi-culture as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, there's a real appreciation of cultures and languages. And also, like you said, theologies and I think we in doing this work for me is navigating the both and mm -hmm. not the either or right or one thing is better than another right um, but yeah holding and maybe maybe this is an exercise as well it just came yeah. to me <laughs> what are two things that seem like completely incongruent to you that you can hold both one in one hand one in the other and and begin to sense that right there's not a separation there can be a connection i think that even like brings in more of that um and kristen you said like right the those that are being oppressed versus those who are the oppressors right like holding that um dichotomy in the body too um creates a lot of like I even as I said that I noticed like in my heart center it was like this eek like this just like um 
tightening and turning um, in my chest. But I think that one thing, especially for those of us who have more privilege because of the way that we look, um, it's, it's so important to sit with that discomfort um, and to acknowledge, right, that we do hold, um, even if we have been on the receiving end of so much harm. Um, and that was a huge part for me was to really sit with the fact that like, no, I do have this oppressor mm -hmm. dynamic within me, even though I have for most of my life experienced so much harm because of my cultural and ethnic identity as well. I, I just want to reflect back. Um, <laughs> Amy popped in and out. <laughs> Amy, you can be with us too. Um, how, when you said uh, you felt the discomfort and you placed your hand there for support and comfort and how sometimes these gestures that we do are a way to help us soothe and, you know, the language of the body is universal. But again, going back to let's not fragment through mis, uh, misconstruing language, but let's connect through the reality that we all have felt harmed mm -hmm. and we all at times have harmed. And those of us who are sensitive, right, who have become healers because we are sensitive to the suffering of others and maybe our own suffering as well, right? We need to learn those ways in which our body communicates to us and also how to work with our body to uh, support ourselves, to be more regulated because when, when I'm in a regulated state, I am much better able to have conversations that are difficult. And this is not easy. <laughs> I have to say, you know, I've been doing a lot of work for a lot of years, including the somatic work, to be able to metabolize and contain some of these intense charges, intense triggers, right, for people around these topics of uh, race, race and culture and ethnicity. And it's, wow, this, this, this are our, our internal organs, right? So in order to translate, if somebody doesn't understand what viscera is, my organs churn. And it's like, I want to explode out of my body sometimes when I am in intense charge. So, you know, it's no wonder there is so much discord out in the world because we're all trying to figure out how to deal with this charge mm -hmm. and yes that's why i popped in inga because i'm getting um i'm getting some personal chats from from folks who are present who maybe don't want to ask publicly yeah. <laughs> um okay you're speaking to it and i just want to give all the voices we can here um they're just i i think you're starting to speak like you said that explosion part they're like what are, what are, what are ways we can, <coughs> excuse me, what are some kind of exercises we can do when we're having these discussions? And I think this person means like when I'm in that discussion and a lot of somatic feelings and sensations are coming up, what can you do as individuals or as a group to invite safety when that happens? Like, how can you, how can you deal with any, you know, in our little SE communities, so I'm, I'm going to maybe do a little commercial break for a second and then go back to this question. A lot of us here are somatic experiencing practitioners or somatic experiencing students. So you guys are tracking everything we talk about like this perfectly, but plenty of us are not. So in order, in the spirit of inclusivity, I want to say that um, SE, somatic experiencing, is a trauma resolution modality founded um, it, as a practice by Dr. Peter Levine, and he gives many shouts out to the indigenous communities and the very many influences that supported him kind of identifying it as a practice early on. Um, SE International is the training organization that trains like therapists, coaches, uh, medical professionals, crisis responders, uh, yoga teachers, you know, all kinds of body workers, really amazing how far the work benefits the world um, on the 
on the modality somatic experiencing. So it's a kind of a neurobiologically based trauma resolution model, really nice to like work with the body and not just the mind psychology or behavioral. So as a thank you for you coming today, if you're hearing about somatic stuff, like brain stuff, you know, however we, however we try to abbreviate this, um, I'd like to give you access to uh, basics. We have a three hour live training called basics that happens monthly. And as our thank you for your participation today, if you email us at public at traumahealing.org, we'll send you a one-time use code to be able to register for that for free. I think it's like a $65 class, something like that. And you can learn a little bit more about these principles. And maybe if you're interested in doing the training and you did the basics and you love it, like email us back. We'll keep chatting with you because we really want to support all people getting access to this training and to know what the heck we're talking about. We're not trying to be, you know, out here with weird languages that are beyond you. But once you start to study the body, you realize like, I can't sit in a business meeting and not feel like, like this amygdala hijack and this body stress and not want the entire room to know that's going on and try and figure out how to bring safety or settling. So all that I'll segue back to you to say, that was kind of the question of like, what are some exercises that you might do if you found yourself in a room feeling particularly activated? Maybe there's something you could say that you would do that privately that no one knows you're doing. Maybe there's something you could invite others to do. And uh, if you guys could weigh in, that would be awesome. And let me, cue me up if you want me to invite anybody to come on screen. Otherwise I'll just follow your lead. Well, I think, uh, Kristen, you had a, an idea, and then I, I have a couple more that just popped in my head. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, I can I can start off. Um, since this activity doesn't involve any any upper body movement, I don't think we need to bring people on. But um, yeah, one that, one that I go to, one exercise I use, um, because if you have activation, if you feel something in your stomach or your body, it's important to move. Um, but if we're online, right, and we're in this little box, you can feel stuck. So one, one thing that I will work with people with uh, to do online is to just tune into your feet. I'm used to letting my hands be a proxy for the feet, but just like if you can sense into your feet, feel into temperature, any tension, tingling, space, spaciousness, just with your feet on the floor between left and right, See if you can notice any differences. Like, does one feel lighter or uh, colder than the other? Or maybe a certain part of the foot feels different. Just be curious about what's there. And as you notice whatever is there, maybe just start to tap back and forth so it's your, your toes going up. You can still feel the heel. And just notice that pressure change as you do left or right. As you're moving, see if that changes any of the sensations you felt that you notice. And then ask your feet, your body, do they wanna go faster or slower? Is there a rhythm that your body wants to do right now? And if you can find that spot, that rhythm, what do you notice inside? What, is, what does that feel like? What does that do for the rest of your body? And I just noticed I took a little bit of a deeper breath. And if it's okay, Another part you can be curious about is when you slow down to a stop. Whenever that's okay, just notice now, how do my feet feel? What do I notice now that they're resting, both in my feet and the rest of my body? What has changed? That's one exercise I use just to to get out a little bit of discharge, especially if you're meeting online like this and nobody can see what you're doing. I, I could even do that at a conference table or meeting table. Nobody has to see what I'm doing with my feet. And 
One that I go to a lot. And like I said, for me, when the intensity begins to rise and I, we feel pressure, I feel pressure, then I feel pressure to discharge that activation by saying what I want to say. And sometimes it might not be the most appropriate thing at the moment for me to say. It might just escalate the tension in the group. So uh, one that I go to a lot is just simply orienting. I kind of disconnect a little bit from the group energy and the conversation that might be uh, upsetting and begin to orient. And nobody needs to know. I'm just disengaging my eyes a little bit and tuning into myself. And um, by orienting to the external world, uh, world through the five senses, you can begin to, uh, the nervous system might begin to slow down a little bit. The pressure might begin to slow down. I will just say caveat is that the, some of the ways in which this manifests is you might feel sweaty palms. You might feel a little trembly because that's the, the release part. And, um, and I'm, my eyes might get a little wet, like I might want to cry. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I was angry, I would just cry. It was a way that I couldn't contain that, you know, that energy of anger. But um, so, and you can take a break too. You can go to another room, splash some water on your face, come back. And, but I don't let go of the energy. I try to hold on to the energy. And once things are calmed down uh, and I feel a little more connected, I might figure out how do I say something that challenging, ch challenges maybe a racist remark without creating more tension, creating more discord. Um, is there a way in which I could do that wisely? Um, but yeah, so orienting, connecting to the five senses in the present moment, trying to let the energy settle so it doesn't come out in more destructive ways. I love all of that. One thing, another thing in addition to that that I, I really enjoy doing um, is bringing in, so I like to call it like um, unconditional nurture, um, some sort of archetype that represents nurture, right? And nurture can be anything like protective, it can be comforting, um, so whatever, like nurture means to, to me in that moment. And, you know, this, whatever this thing is, so it could be an ancestor, right? It can be an animal, it can be a character in a book, it can be, um, a real life person too. Um, and I really like to just envision that that thing, that person, that animal, um, even tool, whatever, even a place as well. Um, so some sort of landscape or scenery and really just bring that into my like felt sense and my energetic field and allow that to sit with me wherever it feels right to have it sit with me um and allow essentially for us to share space but knowing that I'm not alone in this conversation that I have that energetic component with me as well of that person place animal um thing and I have recently found it really empowering also knowing that like it is pulling something from within me right so I'm noticing these, right, like this nurture, protective, calming, whatever it might be, um, element that I'm needing or that I'm wanting to help resource to regulate with me, but also naming that those things are also coming within me too. Um, so it's like this co-regulation, but also naming that like my nervous system, system is doing all the work too. There's so many there's so many little ways and you know to the person who asked the question and maybe others in the group we have this innate intelligence that knows how to do these things and maybe ask yourself what are some of the ways in which I cope healthily right 
that I wasn't even aware that was coming from my own inner intelligence. You know, because we can talk about uh, learning skills, mindfulness skills, you know, other different things. Um, but I trust, I trust that, you know, because for me, a lot became explicit that I was already doing some of the things that were helpful, but I wasn't even aware. So earlier, Shireen put her hand on her heart. Um, I would often put my hands behind my kidneys, and I never knew that our kidneys are where we, our adrenal glands, our adrenaline comes from our adrenals. So they sit on top of the kidneys. In Chinese medicine, kidneys are the seat of fear. And I was supporting my kidneys. And people thought I had a backache, but it was a stress reduction technique. What are some of the things you might already be doing that are helpful that you can bring awareness to? And uh, the thing that I've learned is that awareness magnifies the power of those things. Yeah, and if somebody wants to put in the chat some of the things that maybe they're aware that they naturally do to support themselves, to soothe and regulate. Yeah, I just wanted, as people were doing that, I just wanted, sorry, uh, I just wanted to add, like I'm realizing the, the theme of what is resourcing for us is there's connection. You know, my exercise was connection to the floor, to the ground, um, Shireen's with, you know, nurturers, nurturing who, who nurtures me or what, and Inge, the environment, you know, it's connecting with other, uh, even connecting with your kidneys, like that's resourcing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Belonging and connection, right? Those are big themes in our conversations. That's the theme I was going to pop in on. <laughs> Beat you to it. But you guys, it just goes there. There's a grace in these conversations. It's better than a teaching session. So thank you. It's really so empowering to listen to how empowered you each are all in sharing those things with each other. And um, Anonymous asked a question that's been voted up a few times and I'm, I'm resonating with it. Also just wondering, like, I know how much we say somatic experiencing training, like changes us, you know, I, I, I was a different person before I went in. Um, but I'm imagining that two years of this group has changed you. And I'm wondering, like, as you're talking about a resource and a sense of profound belonging um, and other people who've identified with your identities have said like, oh my gosh, I, I felt so moved when I saw this blurb, like myself was spoken in it. You know, I just feel like the joy of the sense of, oh, I belong somewhere. I'm not just this, I'm not a mestizo bridge without a country. You know, what is that? Like the, I, I hope it, yeah, I just put my foot in the mouth and take it out later, but um. So how would you guys say that your lives or your identity may be different after two years of having done this work together? Do you, do you think it's, it's changed you to have had, I'm thinking of Resma's quote about like, we need group circles to form our, to work through our identity. Um, mm -hmm. We need to gather in one healing moment. I'm just imagining you had two years of solid healing is what I'm making up. Um, so I'd love to hear. So the question was, how are you or your lives different after doing this personal identity work? I had started to say that earlier that um, as a result of this, yeah, and I, let me start by saying, I, it is my personal belief, and I think there is evidence of this being true, that all he, you know, collective trauma in particular has to be healed collectively. There has to be a collective. And, you know, personally, I feel that all healing has to be done in a collective. So for me, having this group, first of all, we have become so deeply connected um, that we, as, as we felt safer, we could reveal more and more to each other. 
right? Which, you know, speaking your truth and beginning to feel the sense of belonging is incredible healing for our physical and mental health because feeling like we don't belong or feeling like we're fragmented or we are at war with parts of ourselves has a deep toll in uh, health and mental health. So, you know, I feel more whole. I feel less polarized within myself and therefore moving in the direction of being less polarizing in the world. Um, so that is one way and I'm sure other things will come, but I wanna hear from Shireen and Kristen. I, for me, really, it has been like this landing place, right? So like for the most part, once a month, right? We gather together and it is a space where I can show up and be very authentic and be very vulnerable and feel really safe being able to do that while also feeling the sense of belonging. And it's such a gift for me because, um, because I, that has not been something in my life where I've been able to drop in with humans who don't necessarily have the same lived experience, but there's so many similarities to the complexities of it. And to just be able to have a landing place where I don't really have to worry about putting on a face or acting a certain way, I can just show up and it's 100% okay to do that. So mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest gift and biggest um, change for me. Yeah. Thank you, Shereen. I was getting tearful and I'm like, of course I don't have tissues. Um, <laughs> but, but more of the same for me me um like my life is different because I've made three lovely friends that I can be authentic with yeah and I want to add to that too of um it's made me more easily name certain identities like um that I can share and engage with another person about that, you know, Eurocentrism just made me, made me present as white. And, and I kind of, my identity, at least the Filipino part, I've always known about, it. it's always been there, but it hasn't ever been presented. I've never like walked into a room or, or introduced that as part of my identity. And a lot gets missed, you know, I don't, I don't experience racism the way I would if I had dark skin but I get missed. Um, so it's, it's made me aware that I have to like name it, you know. Yeah, it's so good to be in a place where you're seen in your fullness. Yeah, it makes me feel more alive. I don't know how else to describe it when, when all of the parts of me are more there. And, you know, I'm happiest, you know, and I have to say for most of my life in the United States, and you can tell I don't have a big Spanish accent. And, you know, that's, I, I really prided myself in assimilation, but I'm the happiest when there's a lot of multiple languages going on. <laughs> Um, I just went back to Miami where I lived for 34 years and I mean I just you know feel ebullient but um, but also any place where oh I was just in New York City too and I just I just love being in multicultural spaces you know it just feels so rich and alive and you know yeah no I'll keep it there <laughs> Heart emoji, heart emoji, heart emoji. And also the chat is full of people who are relating and bonding and appreciating what you're sharing right now. Um, I want to uh, 
Kirtan said she wanted to come on screen. She had a comment to share, and this seems like a nice place to share it, if that's okay with you guys. So if yeah. have Kiana bring her over, and as she's coming over, Kirtan, if you could raise your little blue hand so we can find you in our vast participant list, it would be very helpful. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I, I want to just give a, a shout out for what you're saying that we know that places where people belong, it really touches me that you belong in multicultural spaces. Um, we're trying to create those more at SEI. And so we are creating BIPOC only trainings. And, you know, if someone identifies in that framework, then they can, that framework of identity, they can participate as assistants or, or as participants. And so I'd love to let you guys know that it would be very meaningful to us and your participation today in this free program if you wanted to make a donation to the BIPOC scholarship fund. Um, often we give a shout out like, hey, free programming, here's our NPR commercial time, donate um, to SEI. But I'd really like to invite you to donate to the BIPOC recipients who could be supported by you, um, your donation. And so the way to do that um, Rabia will put a link in the chat that you can click on where you could sign up to make a donation in several categories related to um, anybody who is um, a Black, Indigenous person of color. Um, the link is, I'm trying to remember it, www.traumahealing.org slash give BIPOC, G-I-V-E-B-I-P-O-C. Uh, or the link will be in the chat and we'll also email it to you afterwards. But it would probably, it would say a lot to our guests. We'd be able to see that these donations came in while we were together. And I think that's particularly meaningful as well. This group asked the say, that's where we want donations to go for it too. <laughs> like, like, yeah, we can do that. And we were excited to know we can do that. So if you could be excited to join us in donating there, that would be great. And so um, Kirtan, with that, my little NPR commercial break is over. And I invite you to come off mute and share what it was you had to share. Oh, well, uh, I have to say, I, it's not that I wanted to come on, it's that you asked me to come on. But I, I have, um, I, because I've known Kristen before, and so wonderful to hear you speak, the three of you, and, and feel what it feels like to not have known. Um, just your descriptions of your gifts and your resources and your struggles have meant so much to me to hear because the sense of identity is so with us these days and I have many friends who have well are inheritadoras I don't know of multicultural uh, family um, beauties and when I didn't know it I feel like what the knowing of it has increased my sensitivity for the own my own deep value inside my own psyche that I have unrecognized and that in my clients that I have not recognized. So I feel like the, the qualities that you've named and the discussions you've had have helped us, have helped us grow. And it's just so grateful. Your tenderness really touches me. And I hear that you're seeing more broadly. And I think if we can see more broadly each other's uh, lived experience as human beings with all our complexities, um, wow, how rich we all become and how safer we all become. So thank you. I feel like I belong to more. So good to see you here. Wonderful to see you. There's more belonging we feel when we feel more of you. It's so, you know, recursive. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kirtan. Okay, folks, we've got about 10 or so minutes left. Our time sort of flies as we're mm -hmm. as we're going. We may go a little bit over time because I know there's a lot of richness here so if there's more you'd like to share um this has been a really oh. sacred space and i'm just wondering what else is really here for for y'all like we we didn't know if people would want to get involved and have a lot of questions or not and i think kirtan's voice really speaks for a lot of people who are kind of sitting in awe and wonder and awakening 
with you right now. Um, but really, this is your space, what you've been discovering you want to share for you. And so I just really want to just name that more and say, please make sure what you want, what you want shared in this space. Well, first of all, I want to say that I love how organically things unfold. And that I think that's where I want to live on this planet is where there's not an agenda that I'm bringing to try to make something happen, but that the interactions are what creates that, that flow, the connections are what creates that flow. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about parts of us that were unseen, that we want seen. And, you know, just, I want to leave people with this idea of exploring their inner landscape and all the identities that they hold that maybe they have not shared with the world because, you know, when we bring ourselves fully, we really bring our gifts to the world, so. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. I, I think it's more similar, just be curious, explore, be curious about parts of yourself that are unseen, be curious in other people, you know, um, acknowledge, acknowledge parts that may not be seen. Um, and, you know, maybe you have to form your own group um, or connect with other similar people like we did mm -hmm. to help you process that. Um, but yeah, mostly just when I encourage people to do that. Yeah. yeah. I like, Christian, what you said about that acknowledgement piece, right? Be curious and acknowledge the parts that might be missed. Um, I think that for me personally, especially when I was very young and um, I would discredit parts of my cultural identity uh, because, you know, maybe it didn't look completely like, you know, this culture or that culture, or I didn't like speak the language fluently enough or know it enough or, you know, whatever it might be, um, the not enough, right? But acknowledging mm -hmm. that despite those elements that are perceived as not enough, you know, I still belong just enough into that cultural identity, into my culture, both cultures. There is one more question to ask. So we're getting closer Yay. to the end. I don't want anything to get missed. It was such a good question. <laughs> Another anonymous attendee. <laughs> so we see and feel your heart in this question, anonymous. Um, it's very nice and clear. I'll just read it straight. Is there a value in creating a category for bicultural people to help create spaces for deeper connection and truth? since we may not fully belong to a BIPOC or white category. So is there value in creating a category for bicultural, let's say multicultural people, um, create spaces for deeper connection and truth? Well, we think, I think so. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, when we started to meet, it was with the idea, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And if we feel there's a benefit Let's maybe contem contemplate hosting some of these groups or uh, providing a template to other people to hold space in this way. And uh, yes, I think absolutely, because we're, we're the in-between people, right? Especially if you are uh, in, in a white presenting body in a world that is still binary, right? It's either this or that. I have almost 12% indigenous DNA, but I, I didn't know if I didn't do my 23andMe, but I don't think if I showed up in a BIPOC group that I would be well, I mean, I might be wrong, <laughs> but I didn't feel like I would be well received as, even as Latina, so. Well, yeah, yeah, there's, there's the, will I be received? There's also just knowing 
my experiences are not the same as those people. So, you know, how, how supportive can I be uh, knowing as um, an observer in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah. yeah, I agree. It's so, I think it's so deeply valuable um, because there is like, I know one thing that comes up a lot for me um, is, like I don't want to take up space, right? And spaces where I don't maybe share the exact same experience. Um, and I think that's where creating groups that are, you know, or spaces, communities, um, gathering places for folks who are multicultural, multiracial, multi-heritage um, can be really beneficial, uh, especially for folks who maybe appear or like are in the bodies of those who have more privilege um it can it can create a space for belonging truly I'm like the question fairy popping on and off here <laughs> Really important, really important. And in fact, that part just so contributes in my mind to changing the systemic structures that have caught, that have supported the sort of invisibility you described earlier by um, pulling that out. So I really thank you for naming that. I notice a lot when I'm filling out forms about my race that it's like, am I white, am I Hispanic or am I white Hispanic? And I'm like, duh, the, our relationship to skin culture and heritage. And they're not asking me, well, what's your religious background or your religious mm -hmm. identity? There's, we're really um, kind of at a loss by having a very narrow scope of how we can live in a, in a multifaceted system, right? And find our own space. So I'm just really grateful right now to you guys. This is um, a conversation that I hope we all continue in so many ways. Um, there are many of us living in bodies of all pure white privileged body. I, I, the wrong word to use pure, gosh, I'm always pulling my foot out of my mouth, but just living lives of, of nothing but white privilege who are having to look at ourselves differently. There are people of mixed heritages who are with you right now in a very profound way. And we'll continue this conversation in their own worlds. And I know you guys will continue your cool group and you'll continue supporting each other. And I'm just so grateful you were willing to share this here. We really love highlighting our somatic experiencing practitioners and what the work you do in the world. I know some of you are currently available to see individual clients. Um, I think Shireen and Kristen are both bl blocked full, um, but available for some consultation. Am I wrong, Shireen? Uh, not consultation. Yeah, no, no, no. Not consultation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> not yet. Maybe soon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm the cool. one that said consultation. Yeah, yeah, Inge did. Yeah. Perfect. You guys, here's the core thing I want you to get. These humans are humans and they may be available to consult with you mm -hmm. about various things. And some are available for therapeutic sessions. Um, and if you're an SE in the SC world and you need to get consults and sessions, I think Inga is uh, both of those all the way up through advanced year. Um, and so there's just, there's more of a discussion to have and, and to get in touch with each other and stay in touch with each other and be support networks to each other. Um, if you have in this conversation been struck in a particular way of, you know, I really want to hear about this topic or this topic. And I, I think it relates to public health in a profound way. Please send us an email at public health at traumahealing.org. We're open to your ideas. I was sharing with Inga about this series and she said, I have a wonderful group. <laughs> and I was like, fantastic. And I think we all agree. Um, so I really thank you guys so much for this. And, and I wanna sort of bring us to maybe our, clo our closing inquiry of you know standing here, standing here on this precipice of this conversation um, and where it goes from here. If you could name for yourself what, what you're most grateful for and what your wish for in the world would be, um, what would you have to say as a way to close this out? I think of a mosaic. If you've ever seen a mosaic or one of those uh, big um, fab, uh, I forget the term. See, sometimes when I'm tired and overwhelmed, uh, 
I start reverting to Spanglish, but let's say mosaic. Tapestry. Uh, tapestry. Tapestry. Tapestry, right? There's so many. There's you see the image, but it's so many, you know, um, uh, threads, right? And I think multiculturalism flies in the face of this idea of uh, of whiteness as being the standard, right? And so, um, I really start to think about the ways in which all of these ideas, and you know, it's not just race, ethnicity, and culture, it's other ways in which we identify ourselves that bring this rich tapestry to life. So to, to really begin to embrace that. Um, and yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but that was the, I, I just got a, had an image of the tapestry or the mosaic bringing this, uh, this unity, this um, richer uh, worldview. Yeah, and I'm, I'm grateful for the space, space to be here, space to be with you and uh, the two of you and Anna Margaret as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just grateful to be curious and explore with each other. And um, yeah, I wish the same for everybody here um, and anybody else who may see this and more connection. That's my wish. I'd say I'm very grateful for Inge, for Kristen and for our other group member, Anna Margaret as well, and for the space we've curated together. Um, I'm also really grateful that despite differences, despite different cultures, different languages, different religions, ideologies, theologies, that there's a common denominator of humanity. And within that humanity is oftentimes this great depth of like empathy, compassion, um, and ability to understand one another without even speaking the same language, um, but just sharing the space with one another. Um, throughout the entire world. And so I think my wish for, for ourselves and also for everyone is to be able to move in that humanity, right? Be able to connect with the humanity within us, and the humanity amongst those around us and those across the world as well. Yes, and I really love how we remember and bring to our participants awareness, the member of our group who isn't present, but is here in spirit, Anna Margaret. She's just an amazing human being, transformational coach and yoga teacher in Miami. And uh, yeah, we miss her. Yes, she's awesome. She's with us too, y'all. So if you aren't tracking, their group is actually four people, but one of them isn't with us today, but obviously is. Look at how you just bring in the unseen by seeing. It makes so much sense in the congruence of who you all are. So I just really, really just feel so much love and affection for you all. This has been a really, really wonderful conversation. Just I noticed my nervous system has a lot of like peace and openness inquiry, curiosity, and wonder. And I just really credit you all with resourcing this space with your resources and then just sharing with us your being, your beings are resources um, and our world to know you. So just really thank you. Thank you to SCI for allowing us to have this kind of series, to share this kind of material. Please do feel free to email publichealth at traumahealing.org where the team will support you if you have any questions or follow-up or, or needs. Um, we will be back again this time, probably next month. There's a little bit of question on it next month, but it's always the second Friday of every month at noon mountain time that we gather. Keep an eye on our Facebook page and our social medias for links to register so you get the Zoom link. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. We'll probably, I can't not say this, Inga, you know this one. We'll probably be doing one coming up on the upcoming crisis stabilization and safety program launch. Uh, CSS is a new short professional program coming out of SCI. 
it will be a uh, most of like a one day and a three day or four day training on bringing crisis stabilization resources to people dealing with emergency responses in their community. So everything from medical to first responders to international human rights workers and disaster volunteers will benefit from this program. Therapists, SCPs, and who deals with crisis. Okay, the world. <laughs> I guess that's all of us. We all deal with trauma. We all deal with crisis. So We'll be sharing with you about that program. So keep an eye on our website and our social for the launch of that. We'll have another series about it coming up. Inga has been instrumental in the work group and the work of that program. So that's kind of why I had to shout that out, Kristen and Shereen. I don't, I bet you've all heard about it a little bit too. But yeah, so thank you, thank you, thank you everyone again. Wonderful to be with you. Bear hugs, heart hugs, much love and appreciation. And we will see you next time, this same space next month. Mm -hmm.